Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. A Nigerian writer went to Chibok to talk to the parents of the kidnapped girls and the few that managed to escape. We'll talk about Boko Haram and terror in Nigeria. They use civilians as shield. So they will come and capture a whole village and set up camp there. They will grab women wherever they found them because their whole philosophy is to try to discourage education in Nigeria, especially the education of women. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. In 2014, on the night of April 14th, the sleeping girls heard gunshots. Gunmen stormed into their dorm rooms and rounded them up. The 276 schoolgirls would become known as the Chibok Girls, and they weren't the first or last to be kidnapped by Boko Haram and made into sex slaves. Boko Haram, which roughly translates to Western education is forbidden, has been terrorizing parts of Nigeria since their founding in 2002. Nigerian writer Helan Habila traveled the country speaking to parents, victims, and the few girls that escaped. He wrote about it in a book called The Chibok Girls. Helan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Take us through the events of April 14th. Well, according to my interview with some of the girls that escaped that night, um, what happened was they had the gunshots like you just mentioned, and um, the Boko Haram fighters came in two groups some went into the village and some went to the school. So the ones that went into the village of Chibok were shooting guns. And so when the girls had the gunshots, they were terrified. And the, um, the second group that went to the school told the girls that they were the soldiers and they were there to protect them from the um, terrorists that they could hear um, shooting guns. And so of course the girls were you know, disarmed and they trusted the, the, the men because they were dressed in military uniforms. And according to the girls, the men asked them for their cell phones. They took their phones from them and they gathered them in one place. And then they began to reveal themselves, um, who they were. And they started calling the girls, you know, infidels and things like that. And they let they them. They said, you're not students, you're prostitutes. You're not students, you're prostitutes, you're infidels. And they let them out um, of the school gates to the trucks that were waiting outside. And they took them and drove them to um, Sambiza Forest, which is their base. Some of the girls jumped off the trucks. About 57 girls jumped off the truck. Um, they, at first they were throwing you know, their shoes off the truck and their scarves, you know, trying to um, you know, leave trails where people could, you know, if they were trying to find them, would follow. Um, then they grew really desperate and started jumping off the trucks. They would grab you know, tree branches and then jump off the tracks from there. Some of them were injured. They broke their legs, some broke arms, um, but they managed to get back to the school towards morning. Uh, although some jumped there. and were recaptured. Because the terrorists were following the trucks on their motorbikes, so they would grab the girls as they jump off the trucks and throw them back into the trucks, um, these open back pickup trucks. Why wasn't the government able to find them and rescue them? It's complicated. Um, According to most people, there were rumors that the terrorists were coming to Chibok that night um, to attack Chibok. Um, one pastor that I interviewed told me that he had text messages from people telling them that the terrorists were coming that night. So there was some kind of foreknowledge of that, um, which is not unusual because terrorist, the terrorist Boko Haram would often um, send messages to people telling them they are coming to attack them, you know, to create Why? chaos and to confuse people. And um, fear. And fear. Also, because they believe that their cause is right and God will give them victory, whether they're expected or not expected, whether people know they're coming or not, whether people are prepared or not, they will get victory because it's God's will for them to do what they were about to do. Um, so there was that um, text messages that people got before the attack that night. And um, afterwards, they started calling the soldiers and the police, telling them that this is what we heard. And later, after the girls were taken, they kept on calling them, telling them this will happen. But there was no response from the military. They didn't come to Chibok till um, almost a couple of days after. So the parents, you know, decided to follow the, the terrorists on their own. They formed a little group on their motorbikes and started following the, the trail of the, of the tracks. But they had to come back at a certain point because some people stopped them and told them, you know, you really maybe shouldn't be going after these people because they're heavily armed and they have your girls and you don't want to end up dead, you know, 
um, as well as your girls. Um, so maybe you should go back and wait for the military to come. So it took a while before the Nigerian government swung into action and started you know, trying did to they, find them. Did the government just not take these people seriously? I think so, because there are recordings of the first lady of Nigeria at that time who was even denying that it actually happened, um, that this thing didn't happen, that people were just trying to give her husband a bad name, his government a bad name, you know, trying to gain political points against her husband. So there was that kind of um, political divisions um, in Nigeria, and that played into the hands of the terrorists, and they were able to get away for, for many months before, before people even started to have an inkling of where they might be. You know, there is a hashtag, bring yeah. back our girls, and even Michelle Obama was holding up a, a sign with that hashtag. Was that helpful? It was helpful in the sense that it drew the world's attention to what was happening. How that came about is almost accidental because um, around that time that the girls were taken, the Nigerian government was planning this big economic event. They were hosting the whole world on this big economic forum that they were hosting. Um, and there were presidents from different countries, including the president of China, and um, ministers from other countries. And CNN was there, all the media, you know, was there. And at that time that the government was trying to do this thing, the girls were taken. And so the media was able to focus attention on what was going on, especially CNN's Aisha Sese. She went out of her way and sent reporters to Chibok itself and was interviewing the government ministers and things like that. And of course, that's how people um, around the world started to take notice of what was going on um, in Chiba. There were a, a very few girls that were rescued. How did that come about? Um, the rescue happened almost accidentally. Well, the first girl that was ever um, recovered w happened um, last year. Her name is Amina Ali Nkeki. She was discovered wandering about. So she was not technically rescued. You know, she wasn't taken out of the camp of the terrorists. She was just found around some visa forest wandering with her child and a man who turned out to be a terrorist, a fighter. He said he was conscripted by Boko Haram, but they were all taken. So that was the first girl. Then another girl was discovered towards October, I think. She was discovered almost accidentally by the military. She was in a refugee camp, and they were trying to register the refugees when they discovered that this girl is one of the Chibok girls. And so the attention was drawn you know, of, the, of the government, and she was taken to, to the capital. And then another girl was also discovered, I think, in January this year. So three girls. But there was um, a negotiated release of 21 girls that happened um, towards the end of last year. This was the first time that the terrorists were actually negotiating with the government and releasing the girls. But mm. only 21 they released? 21 girls. They said that more girls would, you know, would follow. Um, so we don't know up to now if the negotiation is going on or um, if it's finished. But you know, people are eagerly anticipating. But um, currently 218 are still being held. 218, yeah. And these are not the only girls in Nigeria that have been taken by Boko Haram. No. I mean, no. this happens on a wide scale. It happened almost routinely. What they do is they use civilians as shield, you know, so they will come and capture a whole village and set, set up camp there. So the people are technically there, you know, they're, they're prisoners. And they, they will grab women wherever they found them, girls, um, boys who they would conscript and turn into into fighters um so there are you know a lot of people more than the chibok girls but the focus is mainly on the chibok girls because of the significance of you know who they are the significance um of their having been taken from a government school in the hands of the government so that is a huge propaganda um tool for the for the terrorists that they we also took these girls. they also attacked boys schools but i think they just killed the boys right yeah this was um some months before they went to chibok this, um, this was in Yobe State, in a town called Buni Yadi. They went and slaughtered 59 boys um, in their dorms. Um, there were girls in that school, but they didn't take them. They just warned them and told them, you know, go back home, get married, you shouldn't go to school. Um, because their whole philosophy is to try to discourage education in Nigeria, especially the education of women and girls, um, who they say shouldn't have Western education. They should just basically get married as soon as they're of age. You met some of the parents of the girls. I met some of them, yes. Obviously, this is very tough for them. Yep. What did you find out? Well, basically why I went to Chibo um, is because I wanted to hear their account of what happened that night um, to, to, to find out um, what they have done since then um, to try to see if they can 
compel the government to help them. Um, so the, the, the lady I met, one of the, her name is um, Yana Galang. She is a huge advocate of this, you know, um, speaking for the girls and trying to pressure the government into doing something. So she travels around the country trying to talk to media houses and government officials. And she related to me what happened that night, you know, gave me her version of the story, how they heard the gunshots, and then they had to escape to the hills to run away from the terrorists. And she never knew that her girl, you know, who was in school that night was taken, um, or one of the girls taken. So when she came down in the morning with the rest of the town, she, she was told by one of her relatives that, you know, they took all the girls from Chibok Secondary School. And she still didn't, it didn't register that her girl was one of the girls taken. She said, well, what of my daughter? And they said, all the girls were taken that night. So she just kind of started going towards the school, running towards the school. And when she went there, she found out, like all the parents, what had happened, empty school. Some of the buildings burned down, um, their clothes, you know, thrown all over the place and no sign of the girls. Only the 59, I mean the 57 that had escaped, managing to make their way back to the school, and who met their parents there at the school. Let's get a historical perspective. When yeah. you were growing up in Nigeria, how did Muslims, Christians, everybody get along? Well, I grew up in the 70s. Um, I lived, you know, in a huge compound with my family and we were only the only Christians in that family but they were Muslims um, living with us and basically things were cordial. Um, the kind of tension that we notice now you know wasn't wasn't there at that time as far as I, as I can remember. Of course I was a child um, but I remember my parents um, exchanging meals um, during the religious festivals of the Muslims they would send us food and we'll send them food during Christmas and you know things like that. And is, is Islamic extremism in Nigeria homegrown or have there been foreign influences? It's complicated. Um, the traditional Muslim group in Nigeria is the, the Sufi. They are called the Sufi Brotherhood. They are the Qadiriya and the Tijaniya. These are the two sects of the Sufi Islamic group in Nigeria and traditionally they have always been very Nonviolent. Nonviolent, very tolerant of other religions. And there are elements of traditional Hausa Nigerian culture that was kind of co opted into their worship. Mm -hmm. So later, when you have these new reformist groups that started um, being influenced by Saudi Arabian preachers and doctrines and things like that, they started turning against the Sufi brotherhoods and calling them infidels, you know, that. Um, they're not Muslim enough. They're not pure enough. So there yeah. was that, this purist. Um, intention on the part of these new emerging um, groups of, of Muslims in Nigeria. So that, that, that started the whole thing and, and they started attacking other Muslims. So the first tension, religious right. tension in Which Nigeria is was between the Muslims themselves, not even against Christians but within the Muslim groups. How did Sharia yeah. law come into Nigeria? Well Sharia has always been there actually. You know the northern part of Nigeria was Islamized even before the coming of the colonial um, masters. So they had all that, you know, Sharia law. That was the basic law that applied. Um, it's, it's almost part of the traditional law system. Um, so it was there. Then the Western government came, the colonial government came, late 19th century, and they imposed the Western form of government and education in Nigeria and introduced their legal system. But, but then Sharia came back into the north. Yeah, but Sharia never left. It was just kind mm. of um, put into the background but doesn't that cause a, a tension between the central government that has a constitution and another form of lo legal system? Yeah, but the agreement was that the constitutional legal system was always going to override the Sharia. So Sharia was optional for Muslims. If you want to have Sharia, you can have Sharia. If you don't want it, you, you, you okay. don't have to. And if you don't agree with the Sharia judgment, you can always up, you know, um, appeal, appeal to, to the um, to the Western And does that work in, it in reality? It worked, yeah. It worked at that time. Up to now, when there was a resurgence around 1999, 2000, when it became kind of a political movement, people started demanding for Sharia because there was a Christian president. So they wanted to use that as a kind of um, blackmail, a kind of bargaining point 
against this Christian Southern president. So there was this emerging split, you know, and this movement, this pro-Sharia movement became really popular. Masses were coming out on the streets, and there was the belief that Sharia was going to give them the kind of justice and the kind of representation that they didn't have under this democratic system. So there, there was that hope, because the democracy itself wasn't working very well. So let me ask you this. There, there are some Western pundits that say that political corruption is what causes Islamic extremism in Nigeria. Do you agree with that? There is that. There is that. There is corruption. Um, there is injustice. There is total disregard, I think, for the small person, the little person on the streets in Nigeria. And there was that feeling by the small man, you know, that we have no stake in this government. We have no voice in this government. And the politicians are living large, you know. It's always in the papers, they are stealing millions of dollars. So that and might encourage people to join yeah. these radical groups. Yeah, so when these radical groups started emerging and telling them, you know, Sharia is the answer, you know, it will give you justice. Turn your back again against Western government, it's all corrupt anyway. We have no stake in this. Sharia is the only way. So people started listening because of the prevalent situation already. Yeah. Uh, you went to Medjugorje? Did I Medjugorje, yes. Uh, that's Boko Haram territory. Correct. What yeah. did you see there? Well, this was um, 2016, January. You, you, you see the signs of the war that had taken place in Medjugorje on the streets. You know, you see the streets, you see the, the bullet holes in the houses. Um, I wanted to see the, the site of the mosque, you know, of um, the Boko Haram leader, Mohammed Yusuf. The mosque is called Ibn Tamiya Mosque. And of course, in 2009, when the government started fighting Boko Haram, they, they went and destroyed that mosque. But that was the place where he set up his base, where he was preaching every day, where his followers would gather. And he had this, it was more like a community center. You know, they would gather, he had schools there, Islamic schools, um, segregated between boys and girls. Um, he had a kind of welfareist system because he would feed his followers, he'd give them food and, and things like that. So um, the government attacked that place. That was one of the basis, the grievances that Boko Haram had when they came back and started fighting the government, that the government um, destroyed their mosque and killed a lot of their followers. Um, so I went there and I saw the, the rubble you know, of, the, of the mosque. Um, visited different sections of Medjugorje. Wherever you go, you just see the presence of the military patrolling the streets, um, behind the sandbags. Um, so it's, it's very much like a war front. You know, there time. are uh, lots of refugee camps for all the internally placed people who have had to flee Boko Haram. Yes. What are the conditions there in those camps? I went, I, I visited um, about two or three. Terrible, that's the word, to describe them. And at that time when I went, they were not as bad as they are now. So it's getting worse. Um, people were still trooping from the um, liberated areas in the rural areas to come into the city. Because the city, in the city they could have protection from military. There was more military presence in the cities. That's why they were coming to the cities. Um, at that time, the, the military was in charge of everything. And the commandant I talked to told me that, you know, I have to provide food for these people. There no, there's no budget for it. My job is to fight Boko Haram. I shouldn't actually be taking care of their food and other things. And there were, of course, the international NGOs, like, you know, like UNICEF and, you know, um, medical groups and things like that, they were there also trying to help. But it was still very much rudimentary. They were just setting up, you know, their, 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 their infrastructure. Um, a lot of orphans. A lot of orphans. A lot, a lot of, of women. Wondering about women who are not related <laughs> to these small boys trying to take care of them. Um, because most of the women couldn't go home. There was this stigma. Most of them, even if they are um, rescued, they are seen these as are Boko women Haram wives. That have been kidnapped and forced into exactly, these marriages. Sex slaves and all that. So they, 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 they can only find refuge in the IDP camps. And then Boko Haram home. actually attacks these refugee camps. Yes, they do that constantly, trying to spread more fear and telling the people that you should come back to us because you have no safety here in the hands of the government. We can reach you whenever we want to reach you. And sometimes they send their spies who would go in as refugees, pretending, pretending to be refugees, but wearing suicide vests, and they would detonate them inside the camps. So it was total, total chaos. Boko Haram pledged allegiance to ISIS in 2015. Correct. 
Why would they do that and what impact has that had? Um, well, the impact hasn't been that much. Um, I think it's more, Boko Haram is, is um, an international organization. By the very nature of its situation in northeastern Nigeria, Meduguri has this border with Cameroon and Chad and Niger. So there's this um, camps of Boko Haram in other countries, not just Nigeria. So that made it a very international organization. But apart from that, it also had affiliations um, with Al-Qaeda in the um, Africa Maghreb, and also with um, the Islamist group in Mali at that time. Um, so that really made them very, very international. But I think what Sheikh wanted to do was to affiliate himself with ISIS and give himself that kind of bragging right that we are part of this international jihadi movement. But like you said, it didn't translate into much. Um, what happened visibly was the improvement in their propaganda video quality. I think they had assistance and help from, from ISIS technicians and things like that. Does um, today, does Boko Haram hold territory in Nigeria? Not very much. They've been really pushed and pushed towards the borders and the fringes. By um, the government? By the government. Um, in January, um, December, the January this year, the government went into Sambisa Forest. This is the stronghold of um, Boko Haram, and they were able to capture one of the main camps. They call it Camp Zero, and they um, retrieved some of the, you know, documents, flags, and things like that that belong to Boko Haram as you know proof of having gone there. And the videos are online, you know, they, they, they are there. So, but the problem is that they still haven't captured Abu Bakr Sheikhau, the leader of Boko Haram, and they haven't um, discovered the girls. So Boko Haram is still there with the do girls, you think still they, active. Do you think that they will eventually? I hope they will, let me put it that way. I hope they will. Um, I think the girls are too precious for them to just kill them or to sell them off. Even because of the propaganda value. Because of the propaganda value and also their value as hostage and, and, and things like that. So And bargaining. Mm -hmm. Bargaining chips, yeah. I think they will hold on to them till the very last. So that is a good, a good, good sign that the girls will still be there. You know, aside from the tremendous human tragedy of, of the deaths and the kidnapping and the um, internally displaced people, what effect have they had on the economy of Nigeria? A lot. A lot. Um, so we're talking about this area. Borno State is the second largest state in the whole of Nigeria. Um, at one point, Boko Haram controlled territory that's as big as the size of Belgium. Um, they disrupted the international trade, you know, between Chad and Niger and Cameroon and Nigeria. This used to be an area that was really um, vibrant in terms of commerce international commerce between these countries. So Boko Haram essentially controlled that and disrupted that. We're not even talking about farmers and farming, um, people living in fear, not being able to go to their farms or to go and fish or to do whatever they were doing, you know, normal economic activities. Then there's also the fact that they killed off the men and conscripted others and killed off others. So everything has been paralyzed by Boko Haram. And now we're seeing the consequence of that. Yeah, this, this, this area is facing um, farming and starvation um, because of the activities of Boko Haram. What's the best way for the United States to help the people of Nigeria? Well, the best way is to try to help in two ways militarily, you know, um, give assistance, sell weapons to the military and train military, and also to, you know, use their spy system, you know, airplanes, um, drones, um, and give the Nigerian government information. That way they can help militarily. There's also the help they can give to, to, the, to, the, to the internal refugees. Um, people are starving, children are dying. Um, there is so much need of this, of, of, of medical assistance, of food, um, of money. Um, so these are the ways that individuals and also the government of America can help. And, and you touched on this before, you know, the, the girls and the women that managed to get away from Boko Haram are not really welcome back into their homes and, and are stigmatized. I mean, are there organizations helping those girls? There are. There are. Um, 
they try to counsel them. Um, they try to, you know, find ways that they can resituate them back into the communities and societies. They try to educate people that, you know, this is not their fault. Um, but of course, the, the people, are, the, the, the women, they are depressed. They feel the stigma and all the knowledge that they come back with of what had happened to them that they cannot share. And the with, children that and are the children a that are visible those... signs of what had happened to them. So it's going to take a long time. It's not something that's going to go away in one day or in one year. It's going to take time for these people to reintegrate back into the society. And that's why the Nigerian government needs to really work and make a long-term plan, not just to defeat Boko Haram, but also to kind of reintegrate these people into the society. Alon, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you very much for having me. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can see all of our programs on WHUT.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.